If you have your Bibles this morning, we'll be looking at Hebrews chapter 12. We have three, three left, all right, three messages left. We've been going through the book of Hebrews, and so this morning and tonight, if you have the outline, I know some uh, teenagers, um, it's front and back, and so you're already dying because you're like, oh my word, but that is Sunday morning and Sunday night, so you can come back tonight, which would be unusual for some of you uh, to get two churches in, in, one, in one day. It'd be unbelievable. You're like, wow, all right? But just think of it, um, just, just think of it of a quarter of the amount of time that you spend watching TV. <laughs> oh, that was just being literal. All right, but anyways, Hebrews chapter 12, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, there was a three-year-old boy, and he received a Superman cape uh, for one of either his birthday or Christmas or something like that. So he received a Superman cape, and he was excited. And so he put on his new uh, costume. He ran outside and uh, started uh, climbing up trees, jumping off, off of the garage. And after a, a few minutes of running and jumping in the backyard off the garage, the boy returned to the house and angrily tore off his new cape ripped it, threw it down on the ground, and with disgust, he said, it doesn't matter how hard I try, this stupid cape does not work. All right? Um, I use that as an illustration because you're going to see, uh, as we start into the Christian life, I think some of you think that it's just like this magic cape. Right? And you think that all of a sudden, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to uh, fly to heaven. I'm going to be able to do all these different things. I'm going to be able to zap people. I'm going to do healings. Unbelievable. All right. But actually, the Christian life in Hebrews chapter 12, and remember, I believe the book of Hebrews is written to Christians. So Hebrews 12 is written to those of us this morning that are believers, and it's telling us what we got into. So let's read uh, Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1 and 2. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I'd like for us to read that together, all right? So follow my lead. You heard me read it. So let's read verses 1 and 2 together here this morning. Let's go uh, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Let's start. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight which so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Heavenly Father, this morning as we look at Hebrews chapter 12 and we look at part of it, I pray that it would be an encouragement to those of us who know you as our Savior. It would be an encouragement to us to keep at the race. Lord, it may be that somebody here this morning has never entered into the race. They're out there and they are working. They're doing some things. They come to church once in a while. And once in a while, maybe even they pick up a Bible, but they have never entered into the race because they've never accepted you as their Savior. We pray that maybe this morning they would find Christ as the author and finisher of their faith. Lord, as we already prayed, I pray that it would be an encouragement. It might be, Lord, convicting to some of us, because maybe we've paused in our race. We've been uh, 
looking at some other things. We have uh, stopped uh, pursuing that finish line that you have for us, Lord, in our race. And I pray that this morning you would do that which I cannot do, and that is speak to hearts. We ask and claim your power in Jesus' name. Amen. In, in chapter 12 and verse 1, we have this word that is found 13 times, uh, two words put together, 13 times in the book of Hebrews. Notice it says, and seeing... Um, we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And there's two little words, let us. All right? And that's found twice. So let me remind you, in Hebrews chapter, uh, well, in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews 13 times uses that phrase. If you want to write them down, I left, if you have the outline, there's some space there to write them down. In Hebrews 4.1 is where we find it first. And it says, let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. So it's that, uh, it introduces that phrase, let us, all right? Hebrews 4.11, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Hebrews 4.14, it says, let us hold fast our profession. Hebrews 4.16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Hebrews 6.1, let us go unto, on unto perfection. Hebrews 10.22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance. Hebrews 10.23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Hebrews 10.24, let us consider one another. And then in Hebrews 12.1, it's listed twice. It says, let us lay aside and let us run with patience. And then uh, in Hebrews uh, 12, 28, it says, let us have grace. Hebrews 13, 13, let us go forth, therefore. And then Hebrews 13 and verse 15, it says, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. So the, the book of Hebrews uses that term, let us. Now, it's in a pose. Remember, the book of Hebrews is doing what? It's introducing the concept that Jesus Christ is better. He's better. He's all the way better. And so here are, and I believe it's uh, Israelites, I believe it's the Hebrew people, and that's why it's written to, or the name of the book is Hebrews. So here are Hebrew people, and they have uh, gotten saved. I believe they accepted Jesus Christ, but there's a temptation to go back to the old way of that law, the old covenant, the old way of, uh, it was works. Everything relied on them, it almost seemed like. And so the author is saying, wait a minute, you got saved through Christ because he's better, and the way to live the Christian life is still through Christ, and he's better. That is the point of the book of Hebrews. And so as we come to Hebrews chapter 12, and once again it's saying this idea of let us. It's showing again the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. Because under the old covenant, that's the law, and what do you always find with the law? Thou shalt. Thou shalt. It's a little angry. <laughs> a little harsh. But here in Hebrews, what is it telling us? Let us. You know what it introduces to you? It's this concept. Under God, what do we have? We have a choice. You have a choice. Even this morning, if you're not saved, you have a choice. I don't understand it because if I was God, I'd say, no. You know what? Bow down, and you're going you're gonna to accept me, or I'm going to smack you upside the head, or I'm going to zap you. I'm just going to punch you right through the middle of the earth. All right, you know what? Love me right now. But that's not how God does it. He wants you through your heart to accept him. It's your choice. And then as we're saved, we still let us. Come on. Now, I love the term let us because it also, not because it reminds me of salad, all right, but because let us, it's, it's, a, it's a plural term, isn't it? Let us, because it also indicates to us the difference now in the Christian life. I don't do it alone. It's us. Christ is there alongside me. The Holy Spirit is there to help me. 
And so as we begin in this idea of the race, I want to consider just a couple of things because that's introduced uh, to us in verse 1. Notice what it says in verse 1. At the end, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And so this morning and this evening, as I was going through chapter 12, I saw seven helps for the race. And I, with God's help, I'd like us to look at seven helps for continuing in the race. And before we get into the helps, I wanted to give us some considerations. First is, we are in a race. Now you'd say, well, that's pretty obvious. But some of you, you're not acting like it. Because you're still sitting. You don't run a race all right, uh, all right, uh, without being all vulnerable. You don't run a race sitting on your duff. Right? You don't do that. You're up and you're moving. Some of you got saved, and guess what? The little boy up there, and that's why I was a little irritated with some of you this morning. Here's a little boy in fourth grade that understood that he got saved, and the next step in his race was to get baptized, and some of you have been saved. You're sitting on your duff, and you never even obeyed him in baptism. You know what you are? You're a sorry runner. That's what you are. Sorry runner. You need to get at the race that God has for you. All of us are called to run. Every one of us. So get involved in the race. Run the race that is set before you. Now, this is the beauty. I don't have to run your race. I run my race because it's individual. God has a race set out for you. And every one of us, you know, in God's race, that's the beauty of it. You know, in the, in the world, we make fun of this because in the world, they, they kind of have this idea, especially with little kids, and then it kind of messes them up when it gets uh, to when they're in 20 and 30s because everybody's a winner. Well, actually, you, every one of us can win our race. You say, how is that possible? I don't know how exactly it's all possible except that it's my race. It's not your race. God has set a plan, a race for me. We run a race. It's not something that is easy. All right, I, I, don't, I don't like running now anymore. And some of you, you may like it. You're older and you like running. All right, and that's what, that's what therapy is for. All right, that's, that's what therapy and different things. But, but I don't, I don't I, as I say, I, I started, I think, running in like fourth grade or, or third grade, uh, involved in sports, and about 24, 25, I, I finally stopped running. So I got so much running in during that time, and coaches yelling and pushing me and all that, that I figure that I deserve not to run anymore, okay? But this is what I know about running. It's not easy. And so right away, if we're running a race, this is what I think is the, the thing that is misunderstood about the Christian life. It's not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be easy. And the devil is going to make it appear that doing things his way is easier. And what I can tell you, it might be temporarily. But most of us, that have been involved a little bit in some exercise. You know, exercise is actually good for you. It is. <laughs> it's good for you. And running the race is good for you as a Christian. So one consideration is we are in a race. Secondly, we are not running to get to heaven. Some people have taken this passage and chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2 and later in the text, and they have used it and kind of twisted it to say that I'm running to get to heaven. In fact, I, I read of an illustration by a man named M.R. Dahan. M.R. Dahan uh, died many years ago. But he said he was visiting in a church one time, and a preacher got up, and he mentioned the title of his message, and he said, my message today is, I therefore so run. And he had three points. Number one was, you have to run to get to heaven. Two, you have to run awful fast to get to heaven. And three, you got to keep on running to get to heaven. 
And this is what M.R. Dehan said. He said that the man had tons of enthusiasm, and by the end of the message, he had the congregation running, jumping, diving, digging, climbing, and flying into heaven. And all the people were, man, they were shouting, they were having a good time, but he said, that was all bogus. I'm not running to get to heaven. There's nothing you can do to get to heaven. There is nothing on your merit that you get to heaven. This is not what it's talking about. I'm running a race now after I'm saved. I'm, I'm, my, my place in heaven is secure. But what I'm doing is I'm running now in this race for what? Because at some time, according to uh, 2 Corinthians, I am going to stand before God and answer for why he's left me here. And so I'm running the race because I want to please him. You know, the Bible mentions a race a few times, besides in Hebrews chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the Bible says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, it says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. Now, both of those verses, one in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the other in 2 Timothy, and now we're in Hebrews chapter 12, and what are we finding? We're seeing that the Bible uses an athletic term. The Bible uses many things to describe the believers walk with the Lord. Uh, he's compared to a child. He's compared to a bride. He's compared to a soldier, a farmer, a member of the body, a light, a branch. The Bible uses pictures to help us to understand things. But guess what the author in Hebrews and in 1 Corinthians 9 and in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 is saying, it's saying that guess what you are? You're an athlete. And you need to train appropriately and you need to understand you're running a race. And you need to be ready for it. So how do I stay at the race? This morning, that's what we're going to look at. And we're going to cover Hopefully just three points this morning, all right? So let's look at these three ideas this morning. First of all, first of all notice what it says. We're uh, with a great cloud of witnesses, and I believe, because remember, that's the context, what was before, uh, some people oppose this, but we've been looking at the context. Hebrews chapter 11 just talked about a whole bunch of witnesses, right? And so... We're in a race, and it says uh, for us to lay aside every weight, and the sin which uh, does so easily beset us. So if I am going to stay at the race, first, I need to lay aside the weights. Lay aside the weights. There's two ideas here that are given to us. The one is weights, and the second is sins, besetting sins. So if I'm going to keep at the weight, uh, keep at the race, I need to lay aside the weights and I need to lay aside the besetting sin. So let's think about both of those things. What is a weight? It's an encumbrant. In fact, that word weight uh, in, in the language means an encumbering, an encumbrance. Uh, and it might not necessarily be a sin, but they are hindering your progress in the Christian race. That's what the word implies, an encumbrance. So the runner is not wearing uh, heavy shoes, a heavy backpack, a heavy clothing, or other items which would weigh the runners down. And I thought of two areas. There's the affairs of this life and there's the cares of this life that basically can encumber us. So what are the, what are the affairs of this life? The affairs of this life are things like sports, uh, they're uh, politics. Um, it could even be materialism. It could be the affairs of this life. It could be schooling. It could be education. It could be things that are out there and they're not bad. But guess what all of those things can do for you? They can come in and they can encumber you. I know people that are more concerned about, they're more concerned about 
not the Bible, but about other books. And other books are okay, but this is the main book. This is what helps me. This is food for my soul. I don't care necessarily, and I, I enjoy reading, and you know that. You know that as a church, we push you to read. But guess what? I do not read the others and set this aside. Because guess what? That's the affairs of this life coming in. I don't get so caught up in all the politics of this world that I forget this book. Now, is it okay to, I think we should, I think we should be concerned about this world. Why? Because we're a light. That's why I'm concerned. I should be, and I, I don't see a problem. I know that uh, there's, there's Ohio State fans here. And just, you know, I mean, I don't know if they really deserve to be number one. All right, I think actually maybe LSU deserves to be number one. But that's again, I mean, and, and, and they, they barely won yesterday. I understand that because, you know what, probably it was rigged. All right, but I know some of, you know, so here, I'm not saying that you shouldn't care about some of that. I think, I think it's enjoyable to sit there. But even, uh, even sometimes as I, I sit and watch a football game sometimes, I'm like, you know, it's really not that important. Do you know how much money is put into that? And if, I mean, I look out there and sometimes I just see a college football team. And in my mind, because I, you know, I sometimes think about finances, I'm, I'm looking at just one guy and I'm like, do you know what all of that probably cost? And then they look at the field and they look at all this stuff and all of this that is, that is just pumped into it. And, and what good is it in the whole scope of things? Those of you that are older, I mean, does it really matter what, some, what college team in 1965 won the tournament? Oh, but you don't really run the race. Watch out for the affairs of this life. Because they just have a tendency. And, and I love it. I, 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 think it's, I think it's great that God has blessed so many of you folks with, with houses and uh, with things like that. But be careful because guess what the affairs of this life can do? That can come and it becomes much more important than this. Run the race. What do you got to do? Lay aside the weights. All right, some of you, spiritually, spiritually, if we could look out this morning, you're looking pretty funny in the spiritual race because there's a whole line of people coming up to the race and they're decked out like racers, you know? They got their tank top on, all right? They got their, they got their shorts, they got their tennis shoes. And here you come up, I'm ready! And you're like, um, why you got your parka on? Spiritually, you got a parka, all right? And then you got a backpack on that. And then it looks like you walk by the weight room and you strapped on some of those 45 pounders there and they're hanging there. And you're like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And we're like, uh, hey, you're running away, a race. Guess what you did? You added some weight. And that weight is encumbering you. What is the Bible telling us? The Bible's telling us if you're going to stay in the race, sometimes those weights have to be set aside. Second thing is a besetting sin. There's a couple ideas that people think about when it comes to the besetting sin. Some people think it's a specific sin to you, which I'm not opposed to that. Some also think that it is, as you're in your race, the devil is very good at setting sin in your sights. I tend to lean towards that. I think there are some sins that are kind of specific to each and every one of us, but I think as you're running the race, guess what the devil's very good at doing? Getting your eyes off the path, isn't he? And it's a sin over there. It reminds me, remember a couple summers ago, we as a church, read Pilgrim's Progress. And as Pilgrim was running, 
his race, his path. Remember, there was a section of the book that talked about bypath meadow. And here he was on the path, but he hopped off the path. And when he hopped off the path, he ended up being taken by a giant in Doubting Castle. Guess what? That's what the devil wants to do. He wants to use a sin to get us. We're running along, and it's just something that's kind of glittery, catching our eye. We're like, oh, you know what? I need, I need a rest stop. Now, just so you know, a rest stop is for drivers, all right? But you know what? I'm, I'm like, I'm kind of driving. I'm running the race. I need a rest stop. So I hop off, and then pretty soon you're off. Guess what the devil's gotten you to do? He's gotten you to take some sin. All right, a weight doesn't necessarily have to be a sin. It's, it can be a care or a fare of this life that is kind of, we have to do it. We're involved in this world. But that's not true with a besetting sin. Sin is sin. And what some of us do is we allow a sin to sidetrack us from our race. The first thing that we see if I'm going to stay at the race is what? I have to lay aside the weights. Spurgeon said this, there is but one crack in the lantern and the wind has found it out and blown out the candle. How great a mischief one unguarded point of character may cause us. Watch out for the besetting sin. The besetting sin that the devil has there that can set you off your path. How do you stay at the race? Lay aside the weights. Secondly, notice in our text in verse 1, it says that we lay aside the weight and the sin with does so easily beset us. And then secondly, let us run with patience. So if I'm going to stay at the race, I have to lay aside the weights. Secondly, I have to run with patience. You know what patience means? It means endurance. And there are three things as I was thinking about uh, patience. There's three things that are going to be required. First of all, if you're going to be patient, if you're going to run with patience, you must have a life of faith. And part of that means that as you're running the race, you've got to trust God in this race. That's faith. As you're running the race, his path that he has for you, there's going to be obstacles. There's going to be ups and downs. If you, if you run some, there's cross-country types. There are all kinds of different types of races. But guess what happens sometimes? There are obstacles. And if it's God's race for you, trust God. A life of faith. Secondly, you have to have a life of fortitude. What is fortitude? That's self-denial. Self-denial is a prerequisite if you are going to stay at the race. I, I, if somebody is a serious runner, all right, if somebody is a serious runner, normally, normally, they're not 450 pounds. I'm just saying. All right, if somebody came up today and they're like, hey, all right, they're walking up to the platform, all right, and they're like 20, 25 years old, all right, and they, and they waddle, all right? They come on up here and they're like, you know what? I know, I mean, they're just, they're huge, all right? And you're like, hey, so what did you just do? You're like, oh, I'm a little tired. I just ran a marathon. You know what you're going to do? You're going to... How dare you? You are so mean. <laughs> you know what? It's just obvious they didn't run a marathon. And guess what? It's going to be obvious to others when you're dedicated to your race. It's obvious. It's going to be obvious. Why? Because you're going to have some self-discipline. While well, I was gone, I, I have a book uh, that I'm finishing up and it, uh, part of the book deals with Christian liberty. And it's a big, Christian liberty and grace 
are a big thing today. And usually the guys that tout the idea of grace, in fact, uh, there's one guy uh, that has said that your sin, that, think about this phrase. In fact, Pastor Malinick and I were talking about it. He taught it to the college on Thursday and Friday. And this is their phrase. They say, you know what? Your sin is only a problem to you. It is not a problem to God. Like, well, it hurts for a little bit, doesn't it? You're like, ah. And then I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah, it was a problem to God. You know why? Because, yeah, Christ, he sent, he sent his son down to die for it. How stupid, are, how stupid a comment. And that is, it's only a problem to you. It's not a problem for God. Yeah, it's a problem to God. And maybe it's not because he doesn't allow it in his presence. Read your Bible. And so here's this idea of liberty. Like I can just, I have Christian liberty. And so this man did a study on Christian liberty. A fundamental guy did a study on it. And guess what you, and it was really interesting. When you see the word liberty normally in the Bible, you know what you'll see it tied to? You'll see it tied in the surrounding context with self-discipline. In fact, the one phrase that says, don't use your liberty to sin. In fact, these grace guys, I would, I would welcome them to read the Bible in Romans 6 where it says, what, hey, wait, what, should we continue in sin that grace should abound? God forbid. That's what God says. And in fact, Jude says that. Don't use the grace of God for your own lasciviousness. And lasciviousness means like a, a wantonness, like a, a license to sin. And you know what? The Bible is indicating to you and I as Christians, if we are going to be faithful in the race, you're going to have some discipline in your Christian life too. I'm not talking about the physical life. I'm talking about in your spiritual life. So what's the disciplines that you have put? What's the forbearance that you have put in place that you're running with patience? You know what you're going to have to work at and discipline yourself to do? You're going to have to discipline yourself to be in this book. Because in the race, you're going to want to set this down. That's, hey, I'm a pastor and this is my livelihood. And guess what? The devil says, ah, you read enough. <laughs> What's one more chapter? You already know it. I mean, you can probably quote it. But I need it. Don't give in to the devil's temptation of a lack of discipline in your spiritual life. Run with patience. A life of faith, a life of fortitude, and a life of forbearance. Patience is mentioned often. So it says patience there. Patience is something that is required if we're going to run the race. And it's required in our life. Now notice these verses. Romans 5 verse 3 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Uh, Romans 15, 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. 1 Timothy 6, 11, But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience. 2 Timothy 3, 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Titus 2, 2, that the aged men may be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, and charity, and patience. And this is what I found as I looked at the word patience in Scripture. Patience is something that good men have in Scripture, but also what it also seems to indicate is that you only gain patience mm -hmm, through struggle. So guess what the Christian life's going to have? Some struggle, some trial, some tribulation. Because that trial brings patience in your life. So understand that when you're running the race and a trial comes, patience is built by trials. 
Patience is maintained through persistence. It's not, patience doesn't grow by quitting. <laughs> Just, you know, that means you weren't patient. Does, does that make sense? If you quit, that doesn't mean you're an example of patience. Right? That means you're an example of a loser. All right, you quit. All right, that's what you are. You're a quitter. So patience, when a, when a trial comes, God is sending that to help you to become more godly and to run the race with patience. Then look at verse 2. Here's our third help for the race. In verse 1, we saw two of them. Lay aside the race. Oh, lay, uh, wait, <laughs> not lay aside the race. <laughs> Some of you have done that. All right, but lay aside the weights. Secondly, let us run with patience. Look at verse 2. Look unto Jesus. Oh, man. And we could do a whole message on that just right there. Roger Bannister was the first man to run a four-minute mile. First man in history to run, as far as what we know, a four-minute mile. Three months later, there was a man named John Landy. John Landy beat Bannister's record. Just three months later, I mean, here for, I mean, decades and centuries, as far as the written record, nobody had beaten this four-minute mile. Then this guy, Roger Bannister, beats it, and three months later, another guy does. So... Somebody, some promoter, had this idea, and so he brought Roger Bannister and John Landy together, and it was going to be the race. You could hear it, all right? If they had radio back then, come see, come see Bannister and Landy, the race of all time, 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 time. All right, and there it is. It's coming, and uh, they have all these people coming, and they're like, yeah. And it's just so you know, it was a, it was a one mile race, pretty short. But on the last, the two were brought together, and so the race happened. As Bannister describes it, on the last, or as Landy describes it, on the last lap, John Landy, remember, so he was the one three months later that beat Bannister's record. Landy was ahead, and he neared the finish line. And in his mind, Landy says this, in his mind, a question was nagging him. And it said, where is Bannister? So guess what he did? You know what he did? He looked back. He looked back, broke his stride, and Roger Bannister schooled him. And he's like, yeah! All right, right there, the first trash talking, all right, of the mile runners. All right, but guess what happened with John Landy? John Landy looked back. And guess what will happen to you? You'll break your stride. And you will falter in your race when you start looking other than to Jesus. He is the author and finisher of your faith. Spurgeon, Spurgeon gave these, three, uh, these four ideas, and I thought they were really good. And so they're there if you have the outline. Notice how he describes Jesus. He calls him the author of our faith, the finisher of our faith, the pattern of our faith, and the goal of our faith. So let's think about those four things as we close this morning. Let's close with this idea that I want to keep at the race. So what habits do I need to put in place? I need to lay aside the weights. I need to run with patience, but I need to look unto Jesus. Why do I look unto him? Because he's the author. You know what the author means? It means the originator. It is where your faith starts. And this morning, let me just touch on this. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can't start the race, you can't get in the race without him. It is Christ. It is only Christ. It is not of your works. All right? Lest any man should boast. It is totally and only by Jesus Christ and his finished work 
that I can get into the ranks. So he is the author. He is the originator. He's my, he, he is the person that I look to. We look to Jesus first. But then he's also the finisher. That word finisher means completer. He was the start. He was the originator, the author of my faith, but he's the completer. He's the finisher. And he said that even on the cross. I think it's a little bit of play on the words when it says he's the finisher of our faith. What did Jesus say on the cross? It is what? Finish. And then notice in the text here, that it tells us in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, and he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and here's this idea because, guess what? It's talking Jesus Christ is better, he's a greater high priest, and he is what? Set down. Remember I talked to you about that way back in, in Hebrews 5, 6, 7, and 8? Where and, and, verse, and, and even in chapter 9, I think it references it in chapter 10. And what does it say? That Jesus sat down. No high priest ever sat down until Jesus Christ. Why? Because their job was never complete. But Jesus in one offering completed it. You see, he's the author. He's the originator. He's the completer. Of our faith, and then he's the pattern. Notice what it says in verse 3 for consider him. He's our pattern. When you are down and tired in your race, you can look to some man, and you know what? A biography is okay. I like reading biographies. I think it encourages us. I think it even, even just recently I finished a, a biography, a short one on Jonathan Edwards, and it encouraged me to be again in God's word and be a student of God's word and to be studious about it. But guess what? Jonathan Edwards, that isn't where I'm going to gain all my hope and faith. It is in Christ. It is in Christ. He's the pattern. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. Because looking at others besides Christ, guess what it's going to do? Weary you and make you faint. Even as great as I am. <laughs> that was facetious, sarcastic. I will let you down, but I can point you to someone who never will. It's Christ. Christ, look unto him. Consider him. Consider him this morning. You're weary in your race. You're tired. You're worn out. I think all of us do. We get burdened down. We get tired. We get worn out. Consider him this morning. Will you consider Christ? Consider how he left his throne in glory and he came down as a sinful man and yet he was sinless. He, he was clothed with humanity and yet sin couldn't penetrate. And he was tempted like as we are yet without sin. And that's why this morning Christ is better. Christ is better than what you're leaning on to get to heaven. Christ is better than what you are leaning on within yourself or maybe on somebody else to run this race. Look unto Jesus, the author, the finisher, the pattern, the goal. Look unto him. He's my goal. He is at the end. He's my aim. True faith never steers, never veers from Jesus Christ. And if you have veered from Jesus Christ this morning as a Christian in your race, get back to be faithful to the race. And one of the ways is look unto him. Look unto Jesus. John Newton, and I put this on the outline. John Newton, and remember he was the one that wrote the song Amazing Grace? Remember John Newton, that wicked, 
slave trader, that, uh, the, the, the man that was just horrid, that was just uh, uh, horrible in his sin. Even other sailors didn't want to be around him. He was such a wicked man. But then he found the grace of God and it saved him. And this is what he said, how tedious and tasteless the hours when Jesus no longer I see. Sweet prospects, sweet birds, sweet flowers have all lost their sweetness to me. But when I am happy with him, December's as pleasant as May. I don't know where he got that one at. I think we should cross that one out. (laughs) But dear Lord, if indeed I am thine, if thou art my son and my song, say what do I languish and pine, and why are my winters so long? Oh, drive these clouds from my sky, thy soul-cheering presence restore, or take me unto thee on high, where winter and clouds are no more. You know what he found? It is tedious. It is tasteless without Christ. And as a Christian here this morning, you found joy in Jesus Christ and the happiness and the joy flooded your soul and you are in a race. And some of you this morning, you began the race with Christ, continue looking to him. And maybe this morning you have never found, you have never entered into the race. Why? Because you've never trusted in Christ. You are in a race It's the devil's race. And it'll lead you to doom and damnation and sorrow. And I challenge you to look unto Jesus this morning. Heads bowed, eyes.